It's going to be all my personal questions that I have received no feedback from you this week. But uh, anyway, it's going to be... Uh, That's not true. Be okay. Uh, a few feedback. And we'll start with the easy ones. So let's just start with a basic question. Uh, we had a talk by Guillaume on guardrails. Uh, I really appreciate this talk. I really appreciate guardrails. I mean, it's a, a very interesting topic uh, when you develop malware. Um, what do you see the... What, what do you see as a challenge in 2023 for EDR evasion from the guardrail uh, point of view? For the guardrail point of view? Well, anyway, okay. whatever um, the point of view, but... From, from my perspective and my knowledge, at, in 2023, uh, guardrails are not really detected um, as a behavior. So I, there, I don't know any EDR that, that see a process looking at the user uh, um, the, the domain variable uh, of the computer and say, hey, this is a guardrail. Obviously, let's, uh, let's block the process. So I don't think it's a problem right now, but it might be in the future. OK. Um, because I, I, I saw a trend between the talks of Guillaume and uh, Charles. Uh, you two modify your code, modify your malware, and it really becomes like a bit weird. Uh, and I have had some challenge evading EDR uh, by just adding piece of layers, things like that. So uh, same question for you, Charles. Uh, do you see your techniques uh, not work in uh, one or two year? Well, I guess it always depends how you implement your stuff, right? Uh, I always try to be as generic as possible, but I'm a bit of an idiot, so I shared those tricks online <laughs> with a bunch of people. So they're not really a secret anymore. Uh, however, I guess it's always about creativity, right? This is something that I added to most of my talk. You just have to be creative. Sometimes you just go in the shower and you think about some weird things and you come up with some ideas, right? At the end of the day, EDR cannot track everything. It's like hooking or kernel callback or all of that. At the end of the day, they cannot hook everything. They cannot have callback everywhere because it's just going to make your system unusable. So you always have to play the catch and mouse game with them. And at the end of the day, it's, it's part of the job, right? Being creative and always coming up with new solutions. So they're going to improve. We're going to improve. Uh, I made a talk uh, six, seven months ago at, uh, at ACFEST about machine learning. For those of you that attended that talk, uh, I was always air quoting machine learning because I don't know anything about machine learning. <laughs> but I know for a fact that they're definitely not using machine learning based on what I presented. You know, typical, super simple evasion techniques still work. And they should be able to detect that with machine learning. So uh, we're definitely not there yet, I guess, from my point of view, which have no value. If I may add, I talked yesterday with some detection engineers, and they talked to me about one indicators that, they, that I see will be a challenge in the future, is saying like this binary is only present on two of your hosts. Like we've only encountered it, this on two hosts, or we've only, the, it's never been seen before on the internet except there. That type of intel is gonna be a real challenge. Much more, you know, obfuscation at the EDR level is there, I think, due to the risk of false positive and so on, this is going to be, there's plenty of years and years and years, and these people are uh, at the forefront of it. But when you were attacking human analysts, these type of metrics saying, in your 10,000 hosts, this binary is only present twice, that's something you should look at. And this is something that I'm going to, in the future, will be much more difficult to evade. And if I can add to that, that's why uh, nowadays side, uh, DLL side loading is so uh, popular because uh, if you have a legitimate process, have a DLL being side loaded, side loaded, and if you do an error afterwards, uh, the alert will come from the signed DLL, which is found on like thousands of, of system worldwide. So uh, the first investigation step will see a, a legit binary. And if I may add regarding this, it's super cool. They can technically detect side loading if the DLL loader is not signed. However, if you look at .NET, you have the concept of app domain, which allow you to actually load a DLL without actually side loading it. And it doesn't have to be signed. So for every problem, there's a solution, literally. But yes, yeah, side loading is definitely cool. This is something that I've 
done in phishing, you use an actual legitimate Microsoft signed binary that you know supports some side loading, so you just ship the executable that is signed and your DLL, so you bypass mark of the web, smart screen, and all of that, and you get your code execution through that actual binary. So it's, once again, just about being creative. Mm. Well, thanks for the answers. I will, I'll talk now about, about deception. Uh, I really like your talk, Lara, about uh, you know tips and tricks and the link between magic and deception. I guess everyone knows that uh, deception is a real topic in our field. You can put fake systems to detect red teamers, for example, and of course, uh, real threats. Uh, have you think about this topic? Do you, do you think uh, magic can be used to, uh, is there a way to, to detect threats with deception? Oh yes, absolutely. So I am also doing purple teaming and more, more days now incident response and we do exactly these type of things. Of course, there's all the common techniques, you know, have a password in GPP, a honey token, inject creds in RAM that don't work, but look at it, uh, look at files. There's not all of these things that are fairly common, but there are ways to cheat. There are ways to have files with beacons. And now, you know, if you're using Canary and all these things are well known, but as you know, most doc files are an XML file inside, and you've had, if you have an external DTD, it can call you. There's lots of things you can do to hint people about doing these things and these things. So yes, deception works for, it's a tool so it can be used both for attack and defense, but there's been such a massive improvement the past few years in honey tokens and these steps. It really changed the layout of the way we do red teaming. Um, myself, I tried first, I'm not technical, so I oftentimes don't rely on these You're cool- You're an amateur, right? Exactly, <laughs> yes. So I don't rely on these, um, uh, on these advanced techniques, I mostly go to people and do stupid things like asking for the files or, ask, you know, and there's no EDR for humans, right? So, yes. Awesome. No. Well, just maybe a take on deception, but from a, an offensive perspective. Uh, for those of you that are familiar with Lulbin, you may have probably heard of MS Bill, which allow you to run an XML file where you have embedded C Sharp, right? So Microsoft response was to actually start to use MSI within that file to actually detect uh, malice, right? Um, and one day I was like, hey, this is XML, right? Why not just using NTT to obfuscate the whole thing? So now what I use is XML entities to actually have my payload encoded using uh, HTML entities, but nobody looks for that because right now MSI is only gonna look at the C-sharp part of this. So it's, it's about deceiving the people that are chasing you, right? So put your code somewhere where it's not pop popular or where they're not looking at. And that way you're always gonna come up with new technique. I've been using this for probably like a year and a half and Microsoft doesn't care. But it's a technique you've been using for a while now. I mean, yes, people who are on your Discord know yes, about this for a while. because I share all my little secret with the world. One similar technique that I share, and I've, some people know about it, is oftentimes you can use your company's, your target's website as a CNC. So think about, for example, a website that has a review field. Then you can craft malware that's gonna read in the review the, 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 the comments and then push the output as an answer that review the item. So when the SOC is looking at the, uh, the, the, the C2, they're not looking at some weird website with an unknown domain or with something else. What they're looking at is your internal computer visiting your main website. There's some beginning and so on, but leveraging trust and deceiving these, uh, so you're not fooling systems, you're fooling the analyst looking at a system saying, oh, this is fine. And that's, again, where deception is useful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and all that note, thanks for Google to uh, create the .zip TLD. That was a terrible idea. <laughs> I think, like, all the domain that were registered so far are definitely malicious. Like, yes. none of them are legitimate. That was the dumbest idea ever. I agree. I think it's an amazing idea. There should be more. <laughs> like, you know, I'm a proponent for PHP 5. I think we should, like, industry should use more PHP 5. <laughs> definitely. <laughs> And like, you know, I think that's a wonderful idea. As a red teamer, I'm all for that. Yeah, yeah, definitely, but I don't even understand what was the point of doing this, like legitimately. According to the blog, they said that .zip is more secure. Right. <laughs> Let's According change to topic. Um, we've, we were starting to receive questions. Thanks, guys. Uh, what's the most important difference between an OK red team and an awesome red team? The report. 
So. But that's true. At the end of the day, you, like you said, what's the, the difference between an OK Red Team and an Awesome Red Team? And I, I believe that the report really does matter. You can be the best hacker in the world if you cannot provide a decent report, it has no value, right? And we tend to overestimate the fact that we're highly technical and the people that are gonna read the report have no clue what we're doing for a living, right? So you can have this super crazy uh, chain of exploit that lead to whatever at the end of the day, they don't care. They don't know what a certificate server is and all of that, so it really depends on how you actually provide the result to the, the customer, right? I've seen cases where they didn't find that much, but it was well written and people still see the value in there, right? So. I guess, from my perspective, it's really whatever you deliver to the client. For me, a red, uh, good red team gets caught. By that I mean, once you've achieved your objective, as a red teamer, you should increase the noise level in a way to get caught. Because you want to give feedback on, did they catch you, and then they, did they take the right decision? Oftentimes, they, you know, we have people saying, oh, yeah, it's just malware. We, AV cleaned it, thanks, thanks done. But Malwares aren't like, malwares are not like shrooms. They don't grow like, you know, if there's malware on your host, somebody put it there and you should investigate. And so oftentimes I think great red team make the blue team work. Definitely. And I think a lot of red teamers are scared to be cut, but at the end of the day, as you pointed out, it's because someone did something great. At the end of the day, uh, we're not invisible to EDRs and stuff like that. It's just that I think EDRs are not ready yet in the sense that everything is an event, but nobody looks at events, right? Uh, they should find a way to make them more useful, and easier to query or whatever, but it's impossible to run something without like existing. Like You're going to leave a trace at some point, and they just need to get better in that sense, but I think they're just not interested yet. And Guillaume, do you have an opinion on that? Yeah, so uh, one, uh, another important aspect is to not spend like half of the project on the external part, because if you don't succeed, you don't provide any value to the client, so it's important to have a uh, clear um, like check mark when you switch phase to the SM breach or the uh, detect and notify phase. Mm. Uh, awesome answers. I really, I really agree with with what you said. I will surf on a few few ingredients here. Um, let's talk about prioritization. Um, so you set up a red team. You prepare your chain. You write your malware. You you, you write awesome stuff. You take all the awesome tricks. Uh, how do you make sure that your attack chain, your attack scenario, will provide? most value to your customers? Uh, yes, uh, go ahead. Well, first you need to make sure that it's not detected immediately because else you won't provide any value. If the clients hire a red team and uh, you don't modify anything, you send your pellet, it's detected, the client gets no value. So my point of view is that try to recon, try to find what is their SIM, their EDR, their, con their, their configuration, uh, mimic it in the a internal environment and when you're 100% sure that it's bypassing it, that, uh, start your, your campaign, and the value will come after that. Sometimes we just called it the white cell. We're saying, hey, white cell, we're going to run this malware. Can you run it just to make sure it's fine? And so we know for sure at that point that it's, that it's all right. I mean, it's, is it cheating? Well, yes, but that's the best way to provide value. So we just, sometimes we just straight up call the client, say, you want a red team? Cool. Make sure this runs on your system. Like, run this. It's totally fine. We swear. Pinky swear. And that's it. And I guess clients also need to understand that we're limited in time and budget. We are limited. So sometimes, yes, of course, if you give me six months, I'll come up with something more exotic. But at the end of the day, it's important that they understand that. Also, if you have an accomplice, make sure that they understand what they have to do. Looking at you, uh, Martin. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, so it's important that everybody's in the loop to actually truly understand what's gonna happen. How many times I had to actually educate client on what an actual red team is, right? It's a buzzword that is used on every recipe. At the end of the day, uh, it's more than that, right? As I kind of briefly touched on my, my talk, it's always about also detecting uh, your capability of detection and how you can actually find a path to crown jewels, right? It's not about, here's a list of thousands of remulty without any context. So they need to understand that we're not gonna give them like a, a result, like a Nessus scan kind of thing, right? And there's a lot of, you know, company businesses and vendors. Uh, like the new thing that I see often is automated red team. I still don't really understand what it is because if you ask them, it's like a scan, but they actually exploit it. So it's an internal test. But 
from my perspective. But at the end of the day, it's an industry that generates probably billions of dollars, so everybody's trying to get a piece of the pie. But I'm going to fight hard to make sure that people understand what is my vision of a red team. And fun fact, I was working at Trustwave years ago, and they're based out of the UK mostly. And a red team in UK is really different than what we consider red team, like what I call now American red team. American red team is what we're used to. UK is more about the modern attack framework and cases, specific cases. They don't, you know, tell the story like we do in America. So it was really different, but for them, that's the reality of what a red team is. So you also have to adapt with your uh, actual crowd. I guess they use the Tiber EU framework. Yeah, all kind like of that. stuff. But that's just the reality. And they also have like Crest that push their agenda and all of that. So, you know, everybody have different standards. Uh, let's surf on that. Do you think they have uh, more maturity than North America? It's different. It's just, you know, Validating a control is good, but sometimes you may miss the whole picture, right? Uh, typical, oh yeah, I patch all my system, but what about your certificate or the release server? Did you actually make sure that your server are probably is configured? Do you, does your template are actually well secured? So it can be up to date, fully patched, but if you have terrible template, it's not going to do anything. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. <I agree. laughs> We have people doing a wave in front, so. Awesome. Don't worry about it. Um, yeah, I'm not sure what's going on with Mr. Marcel. He actually flew from like super far just to be there and see Laurent. So <laughs> he deserves a round of applause. Yeah, <laughs> Jonathan. <laughs> oh shit. Okay. Um, next one. What about you, Martin? Hey. What do you think about all of this? <laughs> <laughs> all of this. Yeah, um, thanks. <laughs> well, well, first of all, for, for the crowd. So I run an internal red team, so it's completely different. We have our own team. The, the dynamic is different, the objective is different, and my, I mean, that's the, that's the base of the question about prioritization, because I ask this question every day. Uh, because once we uh, use tradecraft, we need to rebuild new ones because it's always uh, uh, burned. burned. Burn. Yeah, right. Well, I guess that's a question for you at this point. As an internal red teamer, since you're already the same guy that do this the same kind of stuff over and over, you have to adapt, right? Because it, like as I mentioned earlier, I don't know if you attend my talk, but like the, the signature of your compiler and stuff like that, at some point they may actually realize, oh yeah, we know it's Martin again, he's part of the red team. So as a consultant that just, you know, do my thing and leave, it's slightly different than you, right? So how do you actually adapt to that kind of, you know, they know we're coming, you also have insider knowledge kind of thing, so. Oh, it's quite a challenge, yes. But uh, today I will say that we have a very, very good collaboration with the blue team, and I, I'm a big purple fan. Uh, most of our activities are purple-based, and sometimes we do what we call adversary simulation, just to do a little surprise and uh, have them work at night, at night, a few, uh, few weeks a year. But uh, no, I mean, it, it needs to be collaborative. And, and why do you build a red team in a company? Well, to train, to create opportunities, to improve, to challenge assumptions. So it's all, per, it's all blue driven. Uh, so, so that's how I would answer your question. Fair enough. <laughs> Let's talk about AI. Do you believe that EDR and antivirus solution will leverage AI to the point that the current state of the obfuscation and evasion will not be enough to bypass them. So, <laughs> the people who are pushing AI are the same people who pushed the metaverse last year, <laughs> NFTs the years before, and like, so, is AI a thing? Well, yeah, it's cool. You can make pretty cat pictures and you can chat and even sometimes get a right answer. Um, So is that something that's going to be leveraged? Well, yeah, perhaps. But I think, is the metaverse still a thing? Well, not really. Do we care about NFT? Uh, not really. So I mean, next year, we're going to talk about AI, like this really cool concept that happened once. But don't worry. Like it, There was some point where PKI was a solution in 2000. Then 2002 was the year of the WAF, and, you know, and all these things. So next gen AV was 2006. So, you know, every year we come with a new concept to buy stuff. So it's well, going to be great at selling. Like, lots of sales people are going to sell lots of cool product. 
and they're going to make lots of money. And many industries are going to have a new box with AI powered on it, and it's going to be as useful as the previous one. And yeah, that's it. If I can add to that, I think AI uh, will definitely be it will definitely be an accelerator. Uh, if you were at my presentation, the true like a king proof of concept, it took me like several weeks to understand what was going on. And when ChatGPT came, came out, I just provided the, co uh, the code and it was perfect. It was explaining to me what was going on. So I don't think it, why it will break our payload immediately, but it can help blue team investigate faster. I'm a bit on Laurent's side on this one. I guess it's going to help me write phishing campaign without having typos and grammatical error. I'm not going to have to reach out to my bus to QA my phishing campaign. But apart from that, I think there's a misconception about AI about the fact that it has learning capability. It can only learn what it knows about to a certain extent. So if you ask ChatGPT to come up with a new attack vector that was never seen before, good luck, right? Uh, it probably has some value. It's just... I guess I don't know how to use computers, so I don't really know how to log in to chat GPT, so and I'm probably going to have to write my code myself. And it's all about the data set. Yes. I mean, the internet is dumb. Like, yes. look at it. There's anti-vax things. There's, like, lots of cats, a picture of cats. But, like, think about it. Like, OpenAI is based on the internet we all know and use. So, like, you know, the, the Facebook post of your grandma it's in there, and that's what intelligence is. So think about this next time you're using uh, ChatGPT. Thank you, Laurent. And I, I think as far as I know, ChatGPT is basically a prompt and a UI on top of OpenAI. So yeah. still not sure how this was acquired by Microsoft and not OpenAI, but I don't know much about this. I don't know. It's probably written in Ruby or something like that. <laughs> or Perl, maybe Perl. Any Perl? Dev in there? <laughs> Olivier is not here today, so no. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go for Rust. Rust? Yeah, speaking of that, for those of you that love uh, Windows kernel, uh, latest beta have a part that was written in Rust. That's going to be really interesting. Uh, you're going to have to relearn everything you know about Windows. That's going to be interesting from a red team perspective, evasion perspective. Really looking forward to it. Uh, you can already take a peek at it if you want. It's quite nice. There's some drivers that are already in there written in Rust. We have only seven minutes yet. Yeah, left. Sorry. Uh, so let's. I mean, you, you would like to? Would you like to share some failed stories, uh, red team stories? Uh? My life is a failure. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> Don't say that. Um, yeah, some story, uh, something uh, interesting that you'd, uh, you'd like to share. Go ahead if you want. So sure. my f fastest um, physical intrusion to impact was like five minutes because from the outside, I tailgated, followed someone upstairs, went into a conference room, plugged the uh, internet cable from the, the VoIP uh, phone, uh, looked what was my DNS server, and the DNS server was vulnerable to uh, uh, MS-17-010. Nice. Um, survived five minutes from outside to domain admin. That yeah. was pretty fast. It was in 2017. That's actually really fast. Our record is nine minutes, so five is really blazingly fast. Um, one fail I had was I was calling tech support saying I was someone, and the guy answered, that's me. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't know, I'll be honest, I don't know how you, you can recover from that. I'm like, oh, sorry, wrong, wrong number, and you hang up. Like, Honestly, if ever you have, you know what to answer from this, let me know. But right, that was my, my, yeah. But maybe a, a funny one uh, to a certain extent. So uh, I was working with this client, and we had an accomplice that was told to actually uh, click on the phishing. That was part of the scenario. They know that this person will get fish, right? And for some reason, the person had all the information, the, the subject of the email and all of that, and they still reported the email. So I was like, well, that went well. And funny enough, it was reviewed by the security team, and it was actually marked as safe. So I was like, nah, that ended up being pretty decent. That was a funny one I found. Oh, damn. <laughs> OK, OK. Something else? <laughs> I'm just checking my, my <laughs> awesome questions. I'm sure you have another, another one, Laura. Oh, you're well, good, you're good sadly, there's plenty of fails. Um, it's more a pen test than a red team. But we had a client who made a typo in their IP range. 
And they had the same, like the company, the other company had the same mission. Like they were building widgets and the other one was called the widget factory or something like this. And they had the Grafana endpoint, we pivoted, we hacked their mainframe, dumped all the credit cards, and the client was uh, copied every step saying, that's fine, that's great, continue. And at the end, once we sent like the log of like, we had credit cards and so on, it's, oh, but that's not us. <laughs> and then you were like, hmm, what should we do? And we even called the other client, say, hey client, we apologize, we mistakenly hacked your mainframe from the outside, I apologize, you get a free pen test, congrats, here's a report. And the client was like, no, I don't want to talk to vendor. But yeah, but we went out, I don't want to talk to vendor, don't call me again. And so as far as I know, that client is still vulnerable to this day, because we've never been able to reach them um, right now. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's end with Let's uh, sum it up. a philosophical one. What do you wish for the cybersecurity industry? What do you think is the, their next best move from your perspective as a, a, a simulating adversaries every day? Uh, we talked about it earlier, but uh, only tokens only threads, uh, I, I find them very effective. When I do a red teaming, uh, I'm, be I'm becoming already, uh, automatically paranoid if I find easy credentials on, on the system. I just don't want to look at, the, look at it. So I Deception. think it, it really, uh, it's, it's really strong to use uh, only, only stuff. For me, uh, else, uh, browser is the new LSAS. Everything is in the cloud. You can have 20 MFA factor, I don't care. I'm just gonna steal your cookie. You don't have to touch LSAS. My answer is going to be boring, but for me, one thing we're seeing more and more is involvement of management in red teaming. So suddenly it's not just get domain admin, but test our processes and like do some actual business risk. Uh, in the past, we've stolen a building, if I may say. Like we've found the, the, bu the building certificate of the ownership of sent to the city of Montreal, and we took ownership of a building. That was a pretty big business risk and not IT related. Um, so I think more and more, and you've said it, Martin, more and more as management are involved, red teaming are much more tailored to the business need of the client, and they're much more what the business needs. And it's not just about getting domain admin. And this is something I'm really, really happy. And internal red teaming is something we're seeing more and more that I think brings a lot to this. Thank you, Laura. I think we'll, oh. No, I was just about to say, pass the hash is dead, long live red teaming. <laughs> and pass the hash is not dead. No, really not. <laughs> not yet. All right, well, uh, thanks, guys. It was amazing, uh, amazing talk this afternoon. Thank you very much. Let's have a last round of applause. Thank you.